welcome. I'm Andrea morissette Grazzini, founder and CEO of We The P. I'm delighted today to introduce you to John DeGraff. He is one of We The P's thought leaders, and he's here today to share a little bit about his work in civic engagement that spans several decades. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, well, good to be in Burnsville. So tell me, how did you get started in civic engagement work? Give us a little of your background. Well, it goes kind of back a long time. I've been a public television producer since the late 1970s. I actually started out with uh, Channel 2 in St. Paul before I moved to Seattle. And uh, I think m I before that, I'd been something of an activist around social issues and, and uh, other things. And then I got into television and then mostly just made television for about 15 years, essentially, well, 20 years total, all I did was make TV, and that was kind of my activism as well as my profession. Mm -hmm. But in 1997, I produced a, a film called Affluenza for National PBS, and that show was just a whole lot more popular than anything else I had ever done. And it got me a lot of requests to do speaking. I was asked to write a book on the subject, uh, the third edition of which is coming out this January. Uh, the first edition came out in 2001, so it's still holding up pretty well. Affluenza, so it sounds like a sickness. Yeah, it's well, it's a it's a joke in a sense because what <laughs> I'm doing is combining affluence and influenza mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of a uh, disease, if you will, of overconsuming. Mm -hmm. And so, what one of the things that the program looked at is the price we pay for our emphasis on stuff in America on mm -hmm. constant kind of grow, having to grow all the time, having to produce more and more stuff. And that costs us in many ways, not only environmentally, but also in terms of health, in terms of social, social connection, mm -hmm. and a ver variety of other things. And so uh, that film did get, it attracted a lot of attention. It got four national primetime broadcasts on PBS, which was seen by 10 to 15 million people on public mm. television, mm -hmm. and then it's been used in thousands of high schools and colleges mm -hmm. since that time, and, and the book also, which is now in eight, eight languages. So that propelled me kind of back into the activism phase. I, mm. I kind of liked doing these talks and getting engaged mm. with people, and uh, went from there to saying, how do we actually deal with this issue of overconsuming, and mm -hmm. it was very clear that you can't just tell people, you know, they ought to stop consuming and live like a monk and, mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. in a cave, mm -hmm. put on a hair shirt and mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't make it seem that this is all about sacrifice, because people, whether they should or shouldn't isn't the issue, they don't respond right. to that. And so um, what I believe that I'm, I, was meeting with a number of people who were concerned with this issue. So who are these people? And tell me, I mean, I hear that there, there was such a great response. What do you make of that? You touched a nerve, and why did why did you, I mean, what did, what was happening other than, you know, the great work that you were doing? What what touched a nerve with people? Why were you, what were you hearing when you went out and did these talks and so forth? Well, I think you have to remember the time period. So mm -hmm. this was 1997. Mm -hmm. So this was right in the second Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. It was probably the peak time in which Americans were, everything was going up economically. Mm -hmm. The economy was booming. It was good news, right. There was lots mm -hmm. of employment. Mm -hmm. People were spending Internet as if there was no tomorrow. Internet had just kind of come of its age. Yeah, mm -hmm. the dot-com mm -hmm. boom, right. uh, all of this, this kind of thing. So people were spending as if there was no tomorrow. They were, their assumption was, I can go into debt, I can do all these other kind mm -hmm. of things because the economy is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. And I think there were people out there, myself included, but many, many other people who really questioned whether that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. So those people responded to this documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, also, people dealing with children and seeing, ch uh, there's a lot of concern about kids being very materialistic, wanting everything, demanding that their parents buy me this, buy me that, mm -hmm. uh, kids getting into debt. Uh, and this, so this show and this concept was popular across the country, it was absolutely but as popular in, say, place uh, at colleges like Brigham Young as it was hmm. Hmm. at colleges sure. like Berkeley, you know. So. Where values, it, it pervades all of us, thank mm -hmm. goodness, right? But, the, but speaking of values, so this is a time of, of, of great wealth and hope and excitement about the economy, and you were swimming exactly the opposite right. direction of that. 
and did you not get some pushback and 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 or, or well sure there's always mm -hmm. there's always pushback mm -hmm. saying hey you know don't don't kill a mm -hmm. goose that lay the golden mm -hmm. eggs mm -hmm. and all of that uh, uh, of course that same sort of thing with debate was going on in government and mm -hmm. we were fairly unaware of that um, mm. uh, our new book the new edition of affluenza kind of goes into the things that we so we anticipated that the housing boom wasn't going to continue forever, right, that right. people were getting themselves into situations of debt, and that if anything went wrong, those folks would have a problem. So uh, we, were, we were very clear that we would see an upshift in foreclosures and, and people being unable to meet their... Mm -hmm. What we didn't know was that at the very same time, government was stripping all the rules that actually okay would have, you could have had these foreclosures explain and it would that. not have brought explain the economy that. down. Okay, okay, so okay. explain that. Well, supposing you get a couple of percent, three percent foreclosures or something like that. Mm -hmm. In the old system, the banks would have enough money to cover those things. The banks had to have a certain amount of leverage of, of, of funds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these commercial banks uh, were not allowed to be to go into uh, investing, the, right, right. The, the consumer bank. So that all changed with, in 1999 when the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed by Congress, which mm -hmm. separated, put a firewall between these two types of and banks. And what's Glass-Steagall? Now I've heard of it and uh -huh. it's kind of out in the, in the ether, but explain that to yeah. us if you would. So in 1933, we passed the, uh, um, the law that protected people's savings in the banks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, w when we did that, uh, so that people's savings would be protected up to a certain amount, government wanted to be sure that it wasn't going to have to pay for a huge amount of, of stuff. So it put a limit. It sort of said, you, these commercial banks cannot do lending that is risky. They can't mm -hmm. become, they can't invest in the stock market. They can't do mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. That's too risky. And if it collapses, government is stuck with the bill for right. all of these. So, so. Mm -hmm. That limit was there, and but in 1999, that uh, that act that put that firewall in order to protect the the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation right. FDIC, the FDIC. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, was was eliminated. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was eliminated was the the power of government agencies to regulate financial instruments, these right. so-called derivatives, which were mm -hmm. lots of mortgages all, all put together, mm -hmm. supposedly safe because they had good ones along with the bad ones. Right, and then uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, the whole idea of credit default swaps, which were essentially insurance taken out on the derivatives mm -hmm. by people who were smart enough to realize that eventually these things are going to fall. Mm -hmm. But the company selling the insurance didn't have the money to cover these costs. It all, right, it so was too all, much. So all of this, and there was no control mm -hmm. because we eliminated all the rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we didn't realize what that... What was the logic for limit... For, excuse me, John, but sure. what was the logic for, for, for uh, sunsetting the rules or not having the rules anymore? The idea was that um, the economy was going to keep growing. Okay. You didn't mm -hmm. have to worry about this. Uh, mm -hmm. That if you these rules were kind of killing the goose that laid the golden egg, and they, egg. they were constraining they were the banks constraining from, from the bank, constraining growth. people from getting houses. Got it. Got it. And okay. from getting bigger mm -hmm. houses, from all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So and there then, was so, so then pressure. fast forward, and you guys, then you, you're now in your third edition of Affluenza. You've mm -hmm. had all of these uh, documentaries uh, around it and, and talks and so forth. So y this was predictable to you all when you wrote the first act, uh, affluence. Well, it was predictable 99. that people were going to have trouble. It mm -hmm. wasn't pre predictable that that would send the whole economy c crashing okay. down. Okay. That was not a result of people just overspending. That was a result of government policy gone awry, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, it was a result of the deregulation mm -hmm. of the banks. So, uh, so we got for in our first edition of affluenza. Some of the criticism, there were two key criticisms. Most people liked the book. It was mm -hmm, actually a very mm -hmm. popular book. Mm -hmm. It sold a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Average four stars out of five. Mm -hmm. But the, of the people who didn't like it, the criticisms were twofold. The first one was that there was too much silly jokes and all kinds of mm -hmm, stuff in mm -hmm, it, that it was kind mm -hmm. of too much like a TV show. Got it. The second criticism what was that it didn't stick with a personal critique of people spending beyond their means and stuff, but it mm -hmm. was, it's, went too much into politics, into policy. Got it. So as we wrote the third edition, we considered both of those 
critiques. Mm -hmm. We agreed with the first one, and the, the new book is a little more serious mm -hmm. than the original mm -hmm. ones. It may be feel may feel slightly more academic than, but we disagreed completely with the second one. In fact, the new book is more policy oriented mm -hmm. because we believe that it, the policies are absolutely central to what happened. Got it. So um, I want to move into this individual responsibility that you're talking about because I think it gets into then you, you, uh, uh, you sort of evolved, I'm sure, in parallel into Take Back Your Time, which was an initiative that you headed up and it was a really important one. It's where I first got to know of your work. So can you explain this that? This came out of affluenza mm -hmm. because we, we didn't want to say you got to sacrifice by consuming less, what we wanted to say is you are sacrificing now. You are sacrificing the most important things in life, your health, your connection with your families, mm -hmm. the time that you have to take to exercise, mm -hmm. to eat right, to interact with other people, to spend time in nature. Uh, you're working more than ever, mm -hmm. which we were. Mm -hmm. We were working longer hours today mm -hmm. than in the 1960s, mm -hmm. for example, uh, two-parent families huge expansion mm -hmm. of work with both parents working and I'm obviously not, I don't mean the ha one person should work, but both persons shouldn't have to work 40 hours, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. with kids. Mm -hmm. That's problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So we were saying that, that the price we pay for affluenza is time poverty. That's mm -hmm. the central, mm -hmm. central time. It's overwork. And that the other thing is that the United States is alone among all the rich countries in the world in having no real protections on people's time. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't mm -hmm. have any, you know, required family leave for mothers when they have a baby. So if I'm if I'm poor yeah. in, in my time uh, uh, bank, I'm I'm not going to succeed emotionally, maybe perhaps as well, socially perhaps as well, uh, uh, physically perhaps as well, and even perhaps. Monetarily, I, I'm not sure that you're making that connection, but it sort of sounds like it, 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 it had, you know, the lack of, of sufficient balance and rest would, would create a, a perfect storm for all kinds of issues. Well, two things. Of course, the people who are really working long and not succeeding financially are the people who make very low incomes, and sure. so, mm -hmm. and sometimes even have to make to work two jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's the impact of, of growing inequality in America, which has just mm -hmm. mushroomed in comparison sure. to other countries. Now, in terms of financial satisfaction, people who work more uh, up to a point are generally more financially satisfied. And what's Finan that point? I know you've mentioned this before. It's, it's usually at around the 40-hour work okay. week these days. Mm -hmm. So one thing studies show, uh, the Swedes do a lot of these studies, and one, one thing they show is that people who work 50 hours a week are actually, and make way more money than people who work 40, but are less financially satisfied. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And part of that is because their motivation is more about the money. It's extrinsic rather than intrinsic. Yes. It's it's less about who I am inside right. and you know, am I getting balance in my relationships and my home life and so forth. Now if we look at the benefits to say working thirty hours, mm -hmm. we can see that except for financial satisfaction, uh, the thirty hour folks have uh, they feel more uh, more sat time satisfaction, mm -hmm. they exercise more, they connect with friends and family more, they have far less impact on the environment, mm -hmm. say, than 40 and 50 hour. So they're happier? Yeah, uh, sort of. generally, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, unless they are unemployed or if mm -hmm. the reason for it is that they can't find work that they, they need or they hate their work or mm -hmm. stuff. So happiness is complicated, it, inca it includes a lot of factors, but um, and so let's go into that. Yeah. So then Happiness Initiative is what we've got uh, John in Minnesota here for. I'm very excited to have John because he is a global leader and researcher on happiness of all things. And I want John to share why that's so important and how it relates to take back your time and time balance or time poverty and also how it relates to uh, affluenza and where we're at e economically in this country right now. So will you share why, you know, what are these factors that you speak to and why is this such robust research? It sounds kind of fluffy. It sounds fluffy. It's anything mm -hmm. but fluffy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a tremendous amount of scientific research these days uh, in positive psychology and uh, brain neuroscience and a whole variety of fields about life satisfaction. We're measuring it in ways we never have mm -hmm. before. And one of the things that we understand is that life sat satisfaction is not simply dependent on material well-being. It's dependent on all kinds of, of categories. We call them domains. Uh, in the happiness initiative work that I'm doing, which I'll, I'll get to, we look at 10 different aspects of life. So one of them is financial 
uh, how, how well you're doing so financially. So that is a but factor. We're not saying factor. that it's nothing. It We're is not a saying, factor. No, no, it mm -hmm. is a factor, but it's one of many. It's Got not, it. And it's not necessarily the most important factor. Okay. So the most important factor is social connection, community mm -hmm. vitality. Mm -hmm. And that has to do both with the support you get from friends and family, but also your, your participation in the community, your trust of others, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, relationships are the most important thing you can do for your happiness and for your health. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is an important finding. Mm -hmm. We also look at health. We look at mental health. Mm -hmm. We look at education, uh, and that means not just formal education, but mm -hmm. lifelong learning mm -hmm. opportunities. We look at... Um, Culture, access to arts, to music, to these kinds really? of things. Really? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, important. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as important as social well, connection. So why is arts and music important? I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you there, but and sort of excited to hear this because that's important to me, and I, I guess I can relate, but why is it to others and the rest of us? Because all other things being equal, mm -hmm. on balance, researchers find that people who, who experience and participate in arts and music are happier mm -hmm. than people who don't. And is it it's true that, that if they do in a social environment, because then that yeah. connects to the social right. factors? Right. Okay. So all of mm -hmm. these, all of these things connect. Wonderful. So environment is an important factor, mm -hmm. particularly access to nature and to green space. We know that. And there's a really lot of matters. research on that, right? A lot of research mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. um, government is a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, if you feel distrustful of your government, if mm -hmm. you uh, feel the government doesn't represent you, if your government seems corrupt or mm -hmm. undemocratic, mm -hmm. oh uh, you, you are less happy. I mean, there's no question a, about that. And that, that's a big issue, I think, mm -hmm. increasingly in mm -hmm. the United States mm -hmm. for reasons we won't, we won't go into here. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. time balance is also one of those 10 factors okay. and work satisfaction. Hmm. How do you feel about your job? Do you feel like what you're doing sure. is useful in the world? Do you have control? Do you feel that you're remunerated adequately? Do you have a boss who's a jerk or who's a decent person? Mm -hmm. um, do you have autonomy? Sure. All of those mm -hmm. things, that's uh, kind of work satisfaction. And then time balance, which is basically, do you have enough, do you, does hmm. your life feel rushed? Or does it feel like you, you have adequate time? And that's been my focus, was my focus with Take Back Your Time, and it was my entry into the happiness movement because I was invited to speak at international conferences about happiness as a so-called, and I make no claims in this, but as a mm -hmm. so-called expert on time balance, mm -hmm. on work-life balance. And that's what introduced me to this whole world of people measuring and promoting happiness. So who happiness. are these? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating and it really shouldn't be underestimated because it is really robust and important research. So explain the research and the methods and so forth and then tell us a little bit about who is looking at this research and what impacts is it having? Well, some of this really got started with one tiny country in the Himalayas, and mm -hmm. I've been there recently. It's a country called Bhutan. Mm -hmm. People have heard about gross national happiness, which the mm. king of Bhutan said, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. That little country has really tried to figure out what makes people happy and how do you create policy based on that. Policy. So, policy, absolutely. So they have invited people from all over the world, experts in these areas. They, they first discovered that there were the, these essentially nine or ten key domains that are most associated okay. with with well-being or happiness and then they invited experts in these fields to come and talk to them about hmm. you know what policies are around the world what we know about the science how we can improve life in these various dimensions hmm. and then Bhutan took their message to the rest of the world to okay. the United Nations to conferences and things and uh, they've gotten other people excited about this so this whole field of happiness research has has really grown and but many countries are now measuring beyond going beyond measuring the GDP or the the economy right, right. and, I want to and talk measuring about that. these other factors. So I want to talk about that because I remember seeing Ben Bernanke not long ago saying we have got to look at more than just money to measure right. GDP. Right. Which I, I just it blew my mind. This is Ben Bernanke. He right. was the guy in 1999 that was probably dissenting to your book Affluenza. Maybe not, but certainly would would have had some views that might have been contrary. How did well, that happen? Well, it was happen? mostly Summers and Rubin and, and Greenspan and, okay. and uh, Geithner, you know, okay. who are, uh, were more, more prominent. And mm -hmm. they haven't changed their views. But Ben mm -hmm. Bernanke has adjusted. Okay. And so mm -hmm. how did that happen? So how do you get Ben Bernanke, this, this econ guy, this finance guy, and quite a leader in his field in, in these uh, factors, how does he change his mind and how does he buy that 
there's something more than money. How does he buy that there's, there should be a gross domestic happiness policy? I think the evidence is just becoming too clear to ignore, and many top economists like Joseph Stiglitz mm -hmm. and Jeffrey Sachs and others mm -hmm, have, mm -hmm, have concluded mm -hmm. uh, this uh, around the world. Other countries are saying we got to do this. The UK is measuring well-being and far, going far beyond GDP. Australia, France, Canada has a Canadian index of well-being. So they're, they're mm -hmm. looking at, so I think we can't completely be out of the picture. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were the first to call attention to this, even before the King of Bhutan. It mm -hmm. was Robert Kennedy in his presidential campaign mm -hmm. of 1968 who first said that the GDP, the gross, uh, mm -hmm. gross domestic product, or in, mm -hmm. in those days the, the gross national product, mm -hmm. measures all the wrong things. It doesn't tell us how well we're doing. Mm -hmm. It counts all these negatives. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he talked about the pollution with asbestos of Lake Superior. He talked about mm -hmm. the crime rate. He talked about the illness rate. That all of these things and the cost we spend to take care of them make the GDP or G GNP go up. Mm -hmm. Now all these other important things like our social connection, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the quality of our education. So why aren't we measuring? Why weren't we measuring? Why I understand that we need to measure fi financial and Ben Bernanke and, and Summers and so forth, but so so and he and Kennedy was on to this. But mm -hmm. so so why has it taken us this long to address these factors? I think there are a lot of entrenched interests who mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. necessarily want this conversation to occur. Is it harder to, to measure occur. too? It's yeah, it's a little, a little bit, maybe? yeah, mm -hmm. it is a little harder to okay. measure, mm -hmm. but uh, you know. But they haven't done a great job. Forgive me to, no. to whomever, but they haven't done such a great job measuring the economy either, right? Or the no, predictions or certainly have been. They certainly not haven't predicted right, 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 very right. well mm -hmm. what would happen. Mm -hmm. You know, GDP is fairly easy because basically it's a very simple measure. It's the the total market value of all the goods and services that are produced mm -hmm. in the economy mm -hmm, in a mm -hmm. given year, mm -hmm. and that's the ones that are for sale. Mm -hmm. So housework doesn't count. Right, and it's nice we and macro. A lot of yeah, it, who's measuring? Count. So, how do you measure that kind of stuff? How do you measure social connection? How do you measure how do how does Happiness Initiative, your your, your, your the work that you're doing, and and your research is, and who who where do you get this data from? Well, there are two things here. We uh, right now we're coming to think of the concept of well-being and happiness as being uh, similar but not synonymous. So, mm, okay. when we talk of well-being. This is at, at, from the meetings that I was in with, with people from around the world in Bhutan. Uh, when we talk about well-being, we are m thinking about these object this objective data to measure okay. these things. Okay. So if, okay. if we think of these categories, sure. let's take health as a mm -hmm. category, mm -hmm. then life expectancy mm -hmm. or... Which uh, are very objective. They're, these they're are very measurable. Objective. Very measurable. Obesity, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. those kind mm -hmm. of things. If you take uh, time balance, you can look at work hours mm -hmm. and leisure mm -hmm. time. You can look okay. at, you know, over number mm -hmm. of people in... But how do you measure... Pers I, that makes sense. Yeah. But then there's this pursuit of happiness that we so try to happiness understand here, right? Mm -hmm. Happiness is people's perception, mm -hmm. their subjective perception of how they're doing mm -hmm. in these areas of life. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of questions you ask about health are, how do you feel about your health? I mm -hmm. feel like my health mm -hmm. is excellent. It's good. It's fair. I feel like um, I can do all the things I need to do without suffering too much pain or I feel like I'm in a lot of pain it keeps me mm -hmm. from from doing or I things. trust my government or not that's 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 subjective truly. that's a subjective or my neighbors or right. I worry about this or that okay. exactly mm -hmm. so ha happiness survey which we're involved with in the happiness initiatives mm -hmm. measures these subjective responses okay and any in our view any sensible government uh, body mm -hmm. uh, looking at making policy needs to do both Mm -hmm. That clearly they need all the objective data. So they need you? to know. Absolutely, they do. But yeah. but I'm mean, I'm predicting or, or anticipating what some might say. It's maybe what I'm saying. Who, who are you, are you studying students in colleges? I mean, are are they, are they the survey respondents or where do they come from? Oh well, we we anyone that the survey at happycounts.org, which is the, a survey that takes about 15 minutes. That's right. And it's covered, right online. Yeah, mm -hmm, covers mm -hmm. the the 10 items. Can be taken by anybody. That's you right. just go mm -hmm, online mm -hmm. and you get an instant. Mm -hmm. response when you finish the survey that tells you how well you're doing. And this is at happy.org? Happy Counts. Happycounts.org is where you can take a look at the survey. I remember right, this. Right, right. So we've, we've surveyed now, 
with two surveys. We had a longer one first, now we have a shorter one. Mm -hmm. Altogether, over 40,000 people. Wow. So we have a, a good database. Absolutely. We've also had a special focus on colleges mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's kind of a fun event for college students to sure. do mm -hmm. as a school, see how well they're doing and mm -hmm. so forth. But okay, we've also enough. focused on communities. And, and, and many, and I think you'd shared with me that there's how many different languages that, it, that you do it At last count, I think it's there. It's it's been translated into about eight foreign languages. I mm -hmm. Don't hold me mm -hmm. on that one, mm -hmm. but that it. So we we have it in in, and and that happened because of the city That's of important. Seattle. The city of Seattle mm -hmm. wanted their immigrant populations mm -hmm. to be able to take the survey. So it's mm -hmm. the primary immigrant languages in the city of Seattle, which may not necessarily be the same, but they are. Okay. So Somali, for example, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. it in Somali, mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. Burnsville. We have quite a bit in Minnesota. Have a, yeah, yes, quite a yes. few mm -hmm. Somalis here. We mm -hmm. have it in Oromo, which is an Ethiopian, the mm -hmm. kind of main mm -hmm. language. We have it in, obviously, in Spanish. Mm -hmm. We have it in Russian. We so have, you're getting you know, pretty granular, then. This is not only subjective data, but it's also granular subjective data across different populations and are you seeing differences I, I know you are absolutely mm -hmm. seeing differences so in Seattle we received money from the State Department uh, the City Department of Neighborhoods mm -hmm. to do test uh, surveys with four immigrant populations mm -hmm. Filipino Somali Ethiopian and Vietnamese hmm. okay and so we worked with community leaders uh, for each of these groups in mm -hmm. order to get up to about 200 immigrants to take the survey from okay. each group Got it. and in their language. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at the scores mm -hmm. and we found that the scores were much, much lower than the average Interesting. Uh, scores so there's for a, Seattle. a real difference. And this is just if you could quick explain, um, and, and I, I want to explain it because this is what we're, we're looking at in Burnsville. In Burnsville is a suburb of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, at looking at doing this happiness survey and happiness initiative. And what you do is rather than a bunch of researchers coming in in white coats, although you do have scientists working with you, you're actually having the citizens and citizen leaders get involved. But not only this city council or doctors, it's also citizen groups, right? Yeah, citizen mm -hmm. groups. So this, you know, sometimes works better than right, right. in some situations than in others. Them, I'm sure. A lot of it mm -hmm. depends on having an active leader mm -hmm. in a community mm -hmm. who, who is really excited about this. So we did four things, and they all worked fairly well, and we got good data from all four. Okay. But the, the only one that really used the data and got people very actively involved in the community was the Vietnamese Friendship Association. Okay. And uh, the others had little meetings, but mm -hmm. I, would, I don't want to pretend that these were as successful. But the, mm -hmm. but the Vietnamese Fr Friendship Association town meeting around and was motivated this, and, and was motivated. About it 200 and people some, from the community energies. showed up. Mm -hmm. They uh, were concerned about issues like um, people's and mistrust of government. And they liked the outcomes, government. or like they, they liked yeah. the information they I think did. you shared. The outcomes they were, were telling, and yet, yeah. and I want to get at that a little bit, because that's, that's really what We the P is about, and we want to support people like you and citizens like them who have passions and interests and motivations, and I think we do as well. I think a country does in many, all different sectors and, and types of people. So tell us a little bit about um, what you see that groups like We the P and citizen groups can do to support more of this sort of research and to make, be sure that we're getting more granular, more detail uh, research than just the number of uh, dollars we have or, or not yeah. in our federal bank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a couple things that need to, I think, I think um, at the, at the, the funding is, is key. Mm -hmm. uh, I think somehow we have to interest foundations to a greater degree and communities mm -hmm. in this kind of research and work. Mm -hmm. We tricky. haven't been very good at that. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it us less able, we can get all the data, but it makes us less mm -hmm. able to really break the data down and analyze the mm -hmm. data because that requires... So it needs to be valued work. in a way that, that fund, funders are willing to, to make right. commitments to support so, it. Because mm -hmm. if we can break it down to all the individual questions, mm -hmm. all the demographics, which we, we have, a, you know, mm -hmm. Well, everything from gender and ethnic mm -hmm. background mm -hmm. and age and income. Mm -hmm. We have all of it. So we can really look and say, how are these little segments of a community doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do they answer specific questions? Why does a funder care? Why, why do foundations care? Why do uh, We the P, in fact, is, is a for-profit company? Why would, why would uh, a stakeholder, or I'm sorry, a shareholder care about what's happening in, in various different communities? Why does it matter? Well, it matters because we really need this kind of information to tell us whether 
our policies or our community activities and stuff are making people feel better about their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the goal. We're we getting are, anywhere. We live in a country whose supposedly was founded on the principle mm -hmm. of the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. whose uh, four most prominent so-called founding fathers and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and that it's uh, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Franklin, mm -hmm. all said on many occasions that the real purpose of government, in fact, for Jefferson, the sole orthodox purpose of government mm -hmm. is increasing the happiness of its citizens. Mm -hmm. So we can think of that now as and, flaky. And, 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 and J Jefferson wasn't, wasn't, he wasn't saying money, is it, apparently? No, no, no. Right, right. No, Jeff, happiness mm -hmm. for Jefferson was in the uh, era still, uh, Aristotelian mm -hmm. idea of a, mm -hmm. a life over time that's satisfied. And mm -hmm. I use it as an example of this. Mm -hmm. I'm a personal experience. So my, I, have a, a, I had a personal hero in life is mm -hmm. a man named David Brower, who was a prominent, mm -hmm. maybe the most mm -hmm. famous envir American environmentalist mm -hmm. of the 20th century who mm -hmm. built the Sierra Club, uh, stopped mm -hmm. dams from the Grand Canyon. I knew him personally for the last 28 years of his life. And I saw him a week before he died at a hospital. Mm -hmm. He had cancer. He was 88. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as I was leaving, I wanted to cheer him up because it was not mm -hmm. a happy situation. And I said, gee, Dave, I hope that the next time I see you, you'll be healthy again and out there, back out mm -hmm. there fighting the good mm -hmm. fight. And mm -hmm. he looked at me and said, John, I don't think that's in the cards, but it's been a great 88 years. Mm -hmm. I think that's happiness, is and to be able to say yes, that at yes, the end yes. of however long you have And, your, on this and your mission is to be sure that we can all say that. That we can say that. This is know, wonderful. That, Thank okay. you very much, John. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Sure. John DeGraff, one of We the Peace Thought leaders, and you'll hear a lot more from John and from us. Thank you. Thank you.